Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Fish Bites, the Miami Herald's Miami Marlins podcast. I'm Jordan McPherson, flying solo this week, and we're in the home stretch, everyone. 14 games left entering Tuesday's game against the Cubs. We all know where the Marlins stand at this point. 61-87 record. Need to go at least 7-7 seven and seven to finish with a better record than last year's 95 loss season. It's possible, not guaranteed. When you look at the Marlins schedule left, they have the two games against the Cubs, three game series against the Nationals, and then they go on their final road trip, two games in New York against the Mets, four games in Milwaukee against the Brewers, and then back home for a final three game series against the Atlanta Braves. Seven and seven is possible. Again, not guaranteed. But regardless of the record, there are still things, individual accolades, individual milestones. Uh, just prove it moments even that there are things to be work that there are things that players are striving for toward the end of the season. And this episode is basically going to look at the individual aspects of this Marlins season that's left to look forward to. And to dive right in, obviously the big one is Sandy Alcantara and his chase for to become the first ever Marlins pitcher to win a Cy Young award. And he bolstered his case yet again on Sunday through his fifth complete game of the season by shutting down the Washington Nationals, held him to just one run over his nine innings, needed just over 100 pitches to do so. And when we look at what Alcantara has done this season, five complete games this season, six games where he's throwing at least nine innings. The five complete games are the most in the season since Corey Kluber and Irvin Santana did so in 2017. He's the fifth Marlins pitcher with at least five complete games in the season joining Levon Hernandez, who had nine in 1998, Dontrell Willis, who had seven in 2005, A.J. Burnett, who had seven in 2002, Kevin Brown, who had six in 1997 and five in 1996, and Alex Fernandez, who had five in 1997. Uh, He leads baseball in innings pitched with 212 and two-thirds, which is already the 10th most in franchise history. He'll have a chance to climb up the leaderboard as the season finishes. He has five complete games, which... When we look at baseball as a whole this season, only two other pitchers have multiple complete games. Framber Valdez with the Astros has three. Aaron Nola with the Phillies has two. No other team in baseball has more than three complete games among all of its pitchers. Sandy alone has five. Uh, He's second in the National League in ERA with 2.37 mark. The only person ahead of him is the Dodgers' Julio Arias, who is at 2.27, but has thrown 54 fewer innings. And if I my math is still correct, Sandy has more complete games, five, than Julio Urias has games where he's pitched at least seven innings, which last time I remember checking was four. So just a little bit of context there about how those numbers are made. And Sandy, again, he should be the front runner by all the metrics. Again, he's the only guy who's pitching as deep as consistently and getting the same results as all of the other top pitchers in baseball. And he's got some more, a few more chances here. Uh, he has, he starts at home against the nationals again on Saturday and he's scheduled for both the September 30th start in Milwaukee. And as of right now, he's in line for to put to pitch that regular season finale on October 5th at home against the Braves. It's not a lock that he'll pitch in that game, depending on what the Marlins decide to do with him after those final two, those other two starts. So if you want a guaranteed chance to see Sandy Alcantara in person one more time, be at the ballpark, be at Lone Depot Park on Saturday and see what he can do against the Washington Nationals. Uh, Next up, Miguel Rojas. He has, just like Sandy has the chance to be the first Marlins pitcher to win a Cy Young, Miguel Rojas is a very good chance to be the first Marlins shortstop to win the Gold Glove Award. He was a finalist in 2020 when it was entirely metrics-based. This time, it's back to the combo of metrics plus voting. But if you look at his numbers, he leads the National League among shortstops with a 988 fielding percentage. He's on 57 consecutive games at shortstop without an error, which is a franchise record breaking Hanley Ramirez's previous mark of 54 set in the 2009 season. Per fan graphs, Rojas has 12 defensive runs saved, which are the most among all NL shortstops, and it's tied for second most in all of MLB among shortstops, behind only the Astros' Jeremy Pena, who has 15. 
And according to StatCast, his nine outs above average are the fourth most among shortstops, behind only Dansby Swanson, who has 17, the Cubs' Nico Horner, who has 13, and the Mets' Francisco Lindor, who has 13. I had the chance to talk with Rojas on Monday about just his approach out there and his aggressiveness and just the success he's been having at shortstop. And he always brought up that defense. He brought up that again, defense is his bread and butter. That's how he got into the big leagues was as that defensive replacement for a stack Los Angeles Dodgers team. And he never wanted that to, he never wanted to get away from that. Even when he began moving into that full-time starter role and his, his mindset is he's going out there trying to make the play. He's not trying to, he's not going out there thinking, Oh, if I don't do this, things aren't going to happen. He wants to go out there going, I'm going to try to be, make the play. I'm going to be aggressive. If I make the play great. And I make the highlight. If not, I just move on to the next play. And you, you've seen a few of those bigger plays recently. Just for me, I look at Monday, the second out of the Cubs game on the first inning pop up that goes into shallow left field. He's running. He's close, potentially colliding with Gerard and Carnacion in left field. And he makes the uh, over the shoulder, basically blind basket catch, just going off of instinct, knowing going until I get called off, until the person who's out there who should be making the play says, I've got it. I'm going to make a play. He's turned incredible double plays. He's beaten the, sh- he's done plays in the shift that have, that have helped out. He's turned, I think it's, close to 40 some double plays this year and it helped him have a value for the season. His offense hasn't been great this year. It's turning around now, but in a trying season for him on the field with the offensive struggles and battling through injuries without going on the IL and trying to fight through as much as he can most recently and currently a wrist injury uh, and all the personal stuff that's happened with him this off season with the passing of his mom and his and his abuelo, and just having to deal with so many different elements while playing as much of a full season as he can, he's been able to rely on, or at least lean back on the fact that his defense has been able to carry him through a trying season. And he has about 14 games left and he's close to if, not saying he's going to win the award, but at the very least, I would expect him to be a finalist for the NL award. Again, Dansby Swanson, Francisco and Nico Horner are also in the, in the hunt, in the running for it. So he's in a, he has himself fully immersed in it in what looks like a four person race for that gold glove. Third up John birdie and the stolen base title. Uh, birdie, enters Tuesday with an MLB leading 36 stolen bases and a reminder that he's done that in 88 games. The next closest in Major League Baseball, the Cardinals, Tommy Edmond, and the Orioles, Cedric Mullen, both have 31. But it's also worth noting, Tommy Edmond's played in 143 games. Cedric Mullins has played in 142. Uh, if Birdie can get four more, well, regardless, if Birdie wins the title, he'll be the first Marlins player to win the stolen base title since D strange Gordon swiped 60 bags in 2017. And if birdie can get four more stolen bases over these next two weeks, he'll be the 10th player in Marlins history with 40 stolen bases, which joins a group that includes D strange Gordon, Jose Reyes, Emilio Bonifacio, Hanley Ramirez, Juan Pierre, Luis Castillo, Edgar Renteria, Quilvio Veras and Chuck Carr. Birdie, Again, just since he debuted in 2019, just seeing how much he's made himself become an impactful force on this team has been great, especially when you look at the journey. Again, he was a career minor leaguer, debuted, I believe he was 28, 29 when he finally got up to the big leagues. And when he got up here, he basically became a guy who gets on base, steals a bag, gets himself a scoring position to score a run. And for... 2019, 2020, 2021, he was that defensive replacement, versatility, uh, versatile utility infielder and outfielder. And then this year, when, again, when we look back to that big month of June that he had where he stole about 20 some bases when he had to be the everyday third baseman when both Brian Anderson and Joey Wendell were hurt, he stepped up and was productive and showed that he can be an everyday starter and play extended periods of time and still have that value and be able to still 
have his base pat his recklessness on the base not recklessness his able will be a be able to wreak havoc on the base paths even when he has the extended workload seeing this year for birdie has been really good and has a chance to play 100 games this year which will be which is a pretty big milestone for him uh, another big milestone that's coming up pablo lopez uh his start on tuesday start number 34 this year which his goal from the very start of the season and his goal every year that hasn't happened was to pitch a full season injury free. We've seen every we've seen what's happened in 2018, 2019, 2021. The last is three full seasons in the big leagues, not excluding, not including the pandemic shortened season where he only had to make 11 starts. He hadn't been able to pitch in the second half. Always some some sort of injury or another that derailed it. Last year was Again, he's had the shoulder injuries throughout throughout his career. To be able to get to 30 starts, yes, his starts over the second half have, haven't always been pretty. He's been sort of riding that roller coaster up and down, up and down. Had three pretty good starts in a row uh, before giving up, before having that, that rough outing against the Mets two, a couple times out previous. But for him, the main goal is getting out there throwing the innings, getting the inning count up, and again, staying healthy is his big thing. And if he's able to get through this full year, it's going to be not only a big milestone for him, a big mental accomplishment for him, it's also going to basically raise his value across the big, across Major League Baseball of where he stands in the pitching tiers. He's obviously not at the Sandy Alcantara tier, but he – is establishing himself as a steady number two, number three, depending on the rest of the rotation for basically any big league rotation. Uh, 399 ERA obviously is a little higher than he'd want. Probably if he could get that down to the three, five range, it'd be more ideal. But again, 29 starts as far and away his career high, 160 in the third innings by far his career high. Uh, and he has the results that are going with it. 156 strikeouts against only 50 walks. A 240 batting average against, which is below his career average. Uh, his walks, hits per inning pitch at 1.22 are right about his career average. And this is again with him figuring things out as he goes. He's never pitched more than 111 innings in a season before. So the fact that he's at the 160 mark, he's with this start and and most likely two more, gonna get into that 175 range, and that's a great jumping off point going into next season. And just as a reminder on the business front, again, teams were calling for him at the trade deadline. If he's able to pitch a full season and show he's effective from begin from the from April, May through September, October, it's only gonna make that interest and make those phone calls come even more, most likely once December rolls around, the winter meetings start picking up and the hot stove starts heating up. And just a quick aside here on pitching front. In addition to Pablo, another guy who probably gets some interest over the offseason, Trevor Rogers. Uh, his season is over. He suffered a grade one last strain in his start on Saturday against the Washington Nationals. Nothing major, but again, with 14 games left and Rogers' season being where it is, Marlins just decided to be best to shut him down, let him get rest and recovery and prepare for spring training. Obviously not the season that Trevor Trevor wanted. Uh, we saw the struggles throughout the entire season. Um, pulling up the exact numbers for everything this year, finished with a 5.47 ERA over 23 starts, 106 strikeouts over 107 innings. Uh, that he had that what was the batting average against? Uh, pardon me, but uh, he had a 274 batting average against one and a half whip after doing what he did last year when he was the runner up for National League Rookie of the Year and just not seeing the results come together until the very end when he came back from his month long IL stint with back spasms, put together three pretty good starts against, uh, he had the six innings with one, one earned run against the Rays, six innings with three earned runs against the Phillies and six and a third with two earned runs against the Rangers before the injury against Washington. So you started to see the pieces coming back together and then one last bump in the road to end the season. It's unfortunate for Trevor, but, he feels like he's in a good place going into the offseason. But as a reminder on the business front, lefty, four years of control left. Uh, going into the offseason when, when the Marlins 
need to find a way to get bats and ideally get a true center fielder on their roster. Those would be two names that I would watch and monitor in trade talks going into the off season. And one last section, I'm going to group all these people together. Uh, the young position players who have been getting these last two months to show what they've got. They've got two more weeks to show whether they're worthy of being in consideration for opening day roster spots come 2023, or at least knowing whether or not they have a role in the organization going into the 2000, going to the off season and into the 2023 spring training. Uh, I'll just go over the big names here. JJ Blade. Uh, I feel like even though the results haven't been there since he got called up, he has a role somewhere on this team. His at bats, even without the results, have looked good. It's just for him a matter of when he gets that one pitch to hit, he needs to hit it. And ideally, it would come that role would come as a corner outfielder. He's fine in center field. He's had some gaps, yes. But I feel like if he's able to be a, in the left or right field, that would be the best case scenario for this Marlins team. Uh, Charles LeBlanc, uh, the interesting thing for me, obviously we've seen him play second and third. The fact that he's now getting starting reps at first base, he started there for the first time on Monday, looked pretty, looked decent, looked comfortable out there. If he's able to play first base and keep his hitting the way it is, he entered Tuesday, 285, 778 OPS, nine doubles, four home runs, had one of each in Monday's win, 10 RBI, 13 runs in 130 plate appearances. If he's able to sustain that, that gives the Marlins a little bit more comfort for that position moving forward. Obviously, again, look you look at the group they have right now in-house, it's uh, LeBlanc, if they end up keeping him, keeping him as an option there. Garrett Cooper, who has one more year of arbitration. We'll see what happens with him. And Lewin Diaz, who obviously is the best defender of the group. There's no question about that. But if he's not hitting, it makes it tough to justify him being the everyday starter, especially at a position like first base, where you need to be an above average hitter more often than not to be able to get those everyday reps. So if you have, if you're able to have a platoon situation where you have LeBlanc against lefties and Lewin against righties, it opens up some opportunities there. And then when Lewin's at first, you can always move move Charles LeBlanc around the infield, place place him second, place him third, and still keep his bat in the lineup. Uh, Jordan Groshans, again, the guy who the Marlins got at the trade deadline from the Toronto Blue Jays for Zach Pop, Anthony Bass, and a rookie level catcher whose name is slipping me right now. I apologize for that. Uh, made his MLB debut last week and so far so good. Uh, six games in 300 batting average, 814 OPS safely reached in e each of his last five games after going 0 for three in his debut. Again, small sample size, but compact, simple swing goes for the line drives gap to gap. Really impressed with what he's done defensively at third. He has a good throw. He has a good, he's good throwing arm, a uh, good approach out there. Uh, and again, considering the low risk of the trade, Anthony Bass was on the last year of his deal. He had a club option for next year. Uh, Zach Pop, a guy who I've been high on ever since the Marlins acquired him. And I got my first look at him in spring training last year, but also a guy who was still figuring himself out and was more of a, at this point in time, a mid inning reliever than a high leverage guy and most likely his ceiling was going to be in a setup type role to be able to get a guy like this, who could potentially be an everyday starter for them. Most likely third base seems like the most likely option for him. And if he has a chance to paint out, that's again, a great low risk, high reward trade. And you're seeing some early returns this first week. He looked really good in triple a with the Marlins before getting called up. He was only hitting 250 in the Blue Jays Triple A with the Blue Jays Triple A team in Buffalo before getting traded. And the month with the Marlins, he got his batting average up to 701. He had, I think, four home run, three or four home runs after only having one with with uh Buffalo when he was with with in the Toronto organization. You saw a little bit more of the power coming out. And if he's able to do that, it's gonna be good for the Marlins. And the last two guys I'm gonna touch on, Brian De La Cruz and Herrera Infernacion. Dela Cruz, 
Obviously, we saw the struggles early this season. He was hitting just around the Mendoza line when the Marlins optioned him to AAA Jacksonville in mid-August and spent three weeks there. The main focus that the Marlins wanted him to work on was his game plan at the plate, knowing when to swing, knowing what pitches to look for, not just swinging, not just swinging for the sake of swinging. And it seems like he got the memo. When they called him back up on September 2nd, when rosters expanded, he's played an 11 games since then. He's hitting 333, 10 for 30, with three home runs, a double, 12 RBI, and seven runs scored. Hit a big grand slam in the third inning on Monday to put the Marlins ahead for good against Chicago. And he safely either safely reached base or driven in a run in all 10 of the games in which he's had a one plate appearance since coming back this month. And he looks more confident. He feels more confident. He trusts his swing. He trusts his approach. He looks like he knows what he's doing there now. And he sort of, he's looking like the guy that the that played for the Marlins those final two months last season when they acquired him from the Astros and when he made his MLB debut compared to the guy who was the fourth outfielder to open this season, wasn't exactly sure when he was playing, wasn't sure what position he was playing, wasn't sure where he'd be in the lineup. And now that he sort of has a more solidified role over the close of this season, he is starting to get a little more relaxed, which is helping him be a little more free, easy, and loose at the plate, which is what he needs. And then Gerard Encarnacion, uh, we know he has the power. Uh his average exit velocity is 90.3 mile an hour, nearly a 42% hard hit rate. He's a, he's fine in the corner outfields. He's still pretty raw as a hitter. He still swings and misses too much. I think somewhere down the road, there is a corner outfield spot for him. Probably left field would be ideal for him. I mean, he has the arm for right, but I don't see next year, I don't see him in the opening day roster next year. He's going to need more time in AAA to mature and just get better as a hitter. He has the tools there, but he just needs he needs that seasoning. That's going to be key for him moving down the road and to show that he can do things on a more consistent basis. All right, and now that we're done with some of these player things to watch, uh, and as we mentioned, playoffs aren't in the picture for the big leagues, Playoffs are in the picture for one Marlins minor league affiliate. Uh, the Double A Pensacola Blue Wahoos are beginning their three game series playoff series with the Montgomery Biscuits, the Double A affiliate for the Rays, on Tuesday. That's today of the time of re- this recording. Again, it's best of three series. Whoever wins two gets the title. Uh, game the game game one is in Montgomery. Game two on Thursday and game three, if necessary, on Friday are in Pensacola. All three games we're able to be seeing on MILB.TV if you have a subscription. And the Blue Wahoos have been, of the Mar- Marlins minor league affiliates, I didn't get to get out to the affiliates in person as much as I liked. Got to go to Jupiter a couple times. I saw the Jumbo Shrimp when they played in Gwinnett before the Marlins Brave series last a uh, couple road trips ago. But Pensacola has been, just from a distance, has been a fun team to watch. I mean, they have a bunch of the Marlins' top prospects. I think it's five of their top 30 are with the org right now, are with the AA organization. Uh, Yuri Perez, Dax Fulton, Zach McCambly on the mound. Nassim Nunez and Griffin Conine among the position players. Uh, pitching schedule for the playoffs. It looks like A.J. Ladwig is pitching game one on Tuesday. And I would imagine Yuri Perez and Dax Fulton in some order for games two and three. Uh, we've talked about Yuri and just the dominant year he's had, especially after that first month. Uh, pitch, he pitched on, he last, they both, him, Yuri Perez and Dax Folden last pitched on Friday. So with the regular rest, Thursday and Friday would fit for both of them. Uh, and just some highlights on the position player side for AA Pensacola. Uh, Nassim Nunez, 70 stolen bases on the season, which includes 21 stolen bases since getting promoted to Pensacola where he's played 38 games. He's also hitting 261 with six doubles up there. And for a guy like Nassim, stolen bases and the defense are his bread and butter. Those are his strengths. Those are what's going to carry him. But to start getting the hit tool going is big because if he can hit for average, 
and play gold club caliber sh- defense at shortstop and be able to swipe bag by when as soon as he gets on base, that gives him some va- that gives him some value that can justify an everyday type role for him. Uh, Griffin Conine, 24 home runs, 74 RBI, both of which lead all Marlins prospects and lead the Marlins in general. Uh, 772 OPS strikeout rate is still a little higher than you want. It's down from last year, but still something he needs to work on cutting down a bit. And guy, I want to shout out a little bit. Will Banfield, uh, Marlins catcher from the 2018 draft. Uh, we've known that he's had the offense struggles for a bit now, struggled a decent amount in 2021, was only hitting 204 with a 588 OPS in 71 games with high A Beloit this year, got promoted to Pensacola in the 31 games there, in addition to holding his own behind the plate, 267 average, 707 OPS, maybe starting to turn the corner, which is good considering – the Mar- while the Marlins are fine with their catching position right now in the big leagues between Stallings and Fortes, they really don't have that upper tier catching prospect right now. And if Will Banfield can reestablish himself as that guy who can be basically the number three waiting in the wings, uh, in addition to, yeah, they have Peyton Henry as well. I apologize, Peyton. I sh- can't believe I forgot you there. But if the- Will Banfield can establish himself and they have that one two punch between Will Banfield and Peyton Henry in the minors. That's a plus while they wait for the likes of Joe Mack, who just finishing his first full season of pro ball. He's in high A or he's in single A Jupiter, just finished their season. Uh, if th- While they're waiting for Joe Mack, that'll be good. And speaking of Joe Mack, uh, Marlins have announced their, their players who are going to be going to the Arizona Fall League. Uh, they have seven players going. I'm pulling up the full list now, but among their position player prospects are – Jose Salas, uh, the scene, uh, Jose Salas, Victor Mesa Jr., and Joe Mack. I am very excited to see all three of them, uh, especially since you've seen uh, – I've been high on Jose Salas basically since the Marlins signed him. Victor Mesa Jr. had a pretty decent year in high A Beloit. And Joe Mack, again, he's – probably he's that Marlins, pros- Marlins catching prospect waiting in the wings and has a pr- – and is pretty good at the plate. So you have these three guys who really can show their values. And all three of them will be facing much higher level competition, much older competition. I mean, Salas and Joe Mack are going to be two of the five youngest guys who are going to the fall league. And the four pitchers the Marlins are sending, uh, Justin Fall, Hulk Jones, Chandler Joswiak, and uh, Jorge Mercedes are rounding out the Marlins group going out there. Uh, Arizona Fall League, it starts October 3rd. It runs until November 12th. Marlins are once again playing for the Mesa Solar Sox. And again, it's five or six. It's about, it's five teams. It's prospects from five separate teams compiling each team at the Fall League. 30 game schedule. Uh, It'll be good to follow. Hopefully, you'll be able to get out there for a couple days at some point to see some of those guys in person and provide some updates and reports as the Fall League goes on. But for now, that's going to do it for this week's episode. Tried to keep it short and sweet. Uh, We'll be back again next week with our penultimate episode of the 2022 season. So thanks so much, everyone. And we will be back again next week.